to make a pilot, to make an hour example, which they would call a pilot, so we can see what you have in mind in this thing you call Star Trek. So they made an hour pilot with, um, what's the actor's name who was in there? Jeffrey Hunter. Jim, stick with me. <laughs> no, no, seriously, I need you because... <laughs> You know what happened to, to, to Forrest Kelly? Uh, so, Jeffrey Hunter was cast as the captain, and they made a pilot. And the strangest thing happened. They showed the pilot to the executives at NBC, and NBC said, we don't like it. But we like the idea. So, rewrite another pilot, recast it, and we'll take another look at it. I've never heard of that before, and I've never heard of it since. It's the only example I know of where a studio said we'll spend another whatever they spend on it uh, uh, to see uh, whether you can make a better example of this idea, this Star, this Star Trek idea. So they made another, uh, so, 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 so then they, they called me, I was in New York, and they said, would you come and see this pilot that we made with the idea of being the captain. And so I went to, flew to Hollywood, looked at this thing, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. I mean, I'd buy that right now. But it was a little ponderous, I thought. You know, they said, uh, like the captain would say to the, to the, uh, uh, the navigator, uh, to the starboard, or something like that. Well, you know, if you're five years in a strange galaxy, maybe you might say, hey, George, turn left. <laughs> so I thought maybe a little humor, a little lightness. That was my contribution. And the second pilot sold, and here we are. Thank you. So, so we can all hear. My name is Gavin, and uh, my question is: What did you learn about life and mortality going to space on Blue Origin? What did I learn about life and mortality being up in space? Okay, <laughs> I, I can handle that. So. Um, A friend of mine, uh, Jason Ehrlich was the producer's name. He had produced this series that I did called Better Late Than Never. Woo! It was a... Three, four. <laughs> he, uh, he was wonderful, yeah, he's a wonderful creator of the man. And he said to me one day, you know, there's this thing called Blue Origin that Amazon is doing. Amazon, whatever they call it, uh, Amazon Company, is going to put a spaceship into space and, and uh, it's going to be room for four people. And you, Bill, should be one of them. Ah, I'm not going to go. They don't want that. No, no, Bill. I mean, no, Jason, I am not going to go. And he said later, like a good producer, I took... I didn't take no for an answer, and he called uh, Seattle and talked to some people. They said, well, come on up to Seattle, we'll talk about it. So then he said, I called Seattle, I said, well, don't get up, no, I went, Bill, just go up. Let's. So we went up to Seattle and entered the Amazon building in Seattle. Mm -hmm. The Amazon lobby is about the size of this room. <laughs> in the center, under a spotlight, it's a big bubble of glass. In that bubble of glass is the original Starship Enterprise. Because Jeff Bezos, who is the head of Amazon, and was, maybe still is, the richest man in the world. You're the richest man in the world. Imagine somebody saying that to you. Hello. 
you're the richest man in the world. That's right, I've got billions and billions of dollars. But I like, I love Star Trek. No kidding. So I went in and met, met him in front of the bubble. And we started talking, he was a friendly, lovely man. And then we go to a, a conference table and we sit around and talk and Shatner goes up and he goes, and goes whoa, and then COVID hits. And we don't talk anymore, a year goes by, and then I read where uh, Jeff Bezos and is going up himself with his brother and a lady astronaut who didn't go up and a young man. Now, where he chose all that, I don't know, but those were the four people going up on the first one. So I said to Jason, Jason, you see, I told you. He said, no, no, Bill, said, they're gonna, go. and they go up and they come down and then they announce that they're gonna have another voyage a month later. And Jason says, you can go up to the second. I'm not gonna go up to the second. <laughs> That's like asking the, the, to have the president come and talk to you, the vice president comes and talks to you. I'm not going to go suck it. <laughs> so they call and say, would you like to go up second? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree. So I go up second. So I, I'm trying to imagine how much I should tell you about all this. So, I put out an album, it's out there still uh, on Spotify, uh, called Bill. And Robert Cherno and Dan Miller of They Might Be Giants, you might know his name. Three people know his name. The same three people who knew his name. Uh, Dan Miller, Robert Cherno and I, uh, decided to make an album. Uh, uh, write songs for an album, we sell it. And, we, and so we, we wrote uh, 25 songs and we used 12 or 13 on this album called Bill, which is on Spotify. And we got to really know and love each other. And then I get this offer to go to space. So I'm in New York, I forgot why, on a Sunday evening, I'm gonna go to the desert and, and, and get ready to go up in space on Monday. So I meet with Dan and, and, and Rob, and we decide that we need to write a song about space. And, and we have ideas, we're writing ideas at dinner. Next morning, I, I fly out to, uh, to Van Horn, Texas, and it's the middle of the desert, and I realize that there's nobody else is there except a few technicians, um, because everyone's coming on Tuesday, and this is Monday. Now, why am I here? Nah. What the heck am I here for? Why am I here a day early? I got things to do. I got horses to ride. So somebody says, uh, hey, let's get in the car and go visit the gantry. Visit the gantry? So we drive 20 miles out in the desert and see a large 11, 11 floor gantry, 11 stories high, big gantry. And we're at 4,000 feet. The, 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 the Texas there is 4,000 feet high, almost as high as, as uh, Denver. So when you land in Denver, you take your roll on, you take your luggage, you're already breathless because you're a mile high. I'm almost a mile high in the air, and there's 11 f f story gantry. Says, let's go up the gantry. Go up the gantry, okay, let's go up the gantry. <laughs> so, you know, I walk up three flights, and I'm sucking in the air, and then I let's go another, another three in a row. Finally, I make it. And, I'm, and I'm looking at a room about the size of this. And the, the door is open, it's open about, I, I see the door's open, it's about this thick of cement. I said, what's that? He said, oh, that's a cement room. No, but I mean, it's got 11, it's got a foot of cement all around it. And, and I see air tubes and electrical communicate. What? They said, well, that's a room in case something goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, something goes wrong? What could, what, what do you, what could go wrong? 
Oh no, it's all right. And we go back down, and we go back to the uh, back to the uh, uh. <laughs> so we go back to the thing, and and, and I as I'm driving back. I realize that's why I'm here a day early to see if the old guy could make it eleven flights up to this. <laughs> So the next couple of days, we, in effect, rehearse. And what we rehearse is this. We're going to be in weightlessness, which the word for horse, where is he going with that? <laughs> came into the language about 10,000 years ago. The uh, Proto-European language which was spoken in the, up in Mongolia. And, and then they swept down through Europe. And that's how English and Latin and all that came about. Um, but they discovered that the word for horse came into the vocabulary about 10,000 years ago. And so, so they can tell about the past a great deal by examining languages. Not only that, they found bones and things that along with horses. So not only was the language an example, uh, but verified by other means, that the horse came into our civilization about 10,000 years ago, and, and it acquired a name, acquired a word, horse. There's no word for weightlessness yet, <laughs> because only 600 people, is my understanding, have been in weightlessness. So. To describe what weightlessness is and say, well, you're floating, but you're empty, and, you're gone, <laughs> and you can do, and you can sum yourself, but there's no word, there's no way of expressing, really telling you what weightlessness is to tell you, except to say that it's the most bizarre thing. So they're training us to, when you get out of the seat, okay, we're weightless, you get out, you have about three minutes, and then they say, get back in your seat, now the difficult part is to get back weightless into the seat. Hmm. You hook your, hook your feet underneath you. And then you're in a five-point harness. So there's four waist, shoulders, and then there's the, the crotch strap. Now, I've done a lot of fast car driving. I know how to get into a five-point harness. But when you're like this, because the seat is like this, and you're trying to find the hole for the crotch. <laughs> can't find the hole. So, the hole? I can't find it. And I never did find it. And I was crotchless in weightlessness. And then I was crotchless with seven G's on it. So now we get the two or three days later, we get to the, the gantry. And now the the rocket is there, and it's, there's gas, it's passing gas, okay? <laughs> it's fulminating, and there's gas coming out of there, and I said, what's that? Mm. And they said, oh, it's excess gas bleeding off. I said, well, what's the gas? They said, uh, the gas is hydrogen. <laughs> hydrogen. <laughs> Have you guys heard of the Hindenburg? <laughs> Have you seen that footage on the Hindenburg? Yes. Where everything is burning? Yes. Little people are running away, <laughs> screaming, and the announcer who's announcing the, the Hindenburg came into uh, New Jersey, and, and they, they got a rope up to it and tied off this lighter-than-air 300-foot Zeppelin that would go across the ocean with about 30 or 40 passengers. It was the f first lighter than air spaceship, really. And so it got to New Jersey and they, they tied it off. They moored it like a boat. But they didn't know then, we now know, static electricity. And across the aluminized body to the far end where one of the bags of hydrogen was leaking ignited oh, no. that, the whole thing exploded, and this announcer is saying, oh, the humanity! 
Almighty of the Lord. And, and people are little. People are running away as, as it's burning. That's hydrogen. <laughs> and they're putting hydrogen in his thing. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, why am I here? <laughs> and then I hear, I hear, if anybody wants, if we're, 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 we're removing the gantry. If anybody wants to get off, get off now. <laughs> and I start to loosen up. I think, I'll go. And then I think, I'm Captain Kirk, I can't go. <laughs> release, uh, get out, they're floating around, I don't want to float around, and I get to the window, and I'm looking out the window, but I'm looking back, and I'm seeing the earth, and I'm seeing the wake of the air. I've never heard that described before, but I'm seeing the wake, I look up there, and there's the blackness of space. It's palpable blackness. I see death. I see life. And I found a profound sadness. And I went back into his chair, and I got into the chair, and we land. And when we landed, I got out. I was crying. I was weeping. And I didn't know why. And it took me a couple of hours to realize I was in grief. And what was I in grief for? I've been an ecologist a long time. I've known about global warming for a long time. And I realized that I had seen the earth, I had seen death, and I was aware of us. As we were up there in the air, so many entities had gone extinct. Because things are going extinct right now, as I'm talking to you. Things that we didn't know existed took 3.8 billion years to evolve. And we don't even know they existed, they've gone. Is that sad? Is that like, life is sacred. And we don't know how beautiful those things were, whether they were insects or major animals that gone. I've written a song, which I hope will become a music video, called So Fragile, So Blue. And it's a song, and intertwined in the lyrics is, what can we do? And I hope that there'll be major celebrities who will say those words, what can we do? Because I say to you, what can we do? Because we've got to do something. What can we do? What can we do? Thank you.